Hi everyone. Um, it's lovely to be part of this virtual event and I want to send you all my uh, good wishes. I hope everyone is safe and well, that a vaccine vial is on its way to you very soon and that one day we'll all be able to meet again in person. I want to talk today about a project I'm about to embark on with some Australian colleagues, Noah Reisman from the Australian Catholic University, Tristan Moss at UNSW Canberra, and Alana Piper at the University of Technology in Sydney, um, a project on sexual cultures in the Australian military from the First World War to the present. Now, in this project, we want to try and investigate several elements of the way that military service and sexuality intersect. That includes things like the treatment of LGBTI service personnel, the governance of intimate relationships um, within the military and the place of sexual health in military medicine. But of course, and inevitably, it includes the commission of sexual violence, both that perpetrated by military personnel and that perpetrated against military personnel, often by their peers and colleagues. Now, while all of us working on this project are historians, there are clear resonances with the concerns of the contemporary Australian Defence Forces. In 2012, following revelations of ongoing sexual abuse within the Australian Defence Force, the organisation embarked on a strategy for cultural change entitled Pathway to Change. Nine years later, the ADF still regularly references this document as its blueprint for cultural change throughout its institutions. However, there is very little in this document about the history of sex, sexuality and gender in the ADF, which suggests that there's a need to try and integrate the scholarship that does exist on this topic and make it available and comprehensible to policy members, policy makers, I'm sorry, within and outside the ADF. The social and cultural turn in military history means that we know that sex in the Australian military, sex and militaries everywhere, have always been intertwined. And that our work that we plan to do, the work we want to do in archives and also the interviews that form part of the project, interviews with past members of the ADF, will sit within that broader narrative framework. Now, this scholarship um, demonstrates that like their civilian counterparts, military personnel engage in sexual activities, they form relationships and they build families, but they also experience sexual activity that has been shaped by the nature of their service. Scholarship from the last 30 years tells us in the Australian context that Australian authorities were exercised over a whole bunch of matters. Um, the best way to manage soldiers' visit to sex workers during the First World War, were very worried about the potential spread of the renewal disease amongst the troops and the Australian community back home. Pioneering research has shown that Australian troops um, engaged in clandestine homosexual activity in the Second World War, sometimes with American partners who risked significant sanction. Australian men also developed relationships across racial barriers during the post-war occupation of Japan and Australia's Cold War conflicts in Southeast Asia, relationships that challenged the racial hierarchies of post-war Australia. Medical histories of the ADF in the conflicts of the 20th century show that the armed forces have long been acutely interested in policing the sexual practices of service members, especially service women, from both a medical and a moral perspective. Then, of course, there is the question of sexual violence. And there is important and growing literature on sexual violence in militaries and in wartime. Some of it authored some very important pieces authored by participants in this symposium. Now, in terms of my own discipline of history, to my mind, some of the key interventions in the last decade or so have been work by scholars who seek to very closely document and explain the character and extent of sexual violence committed by allied personnel in certain th um, theatres of both world wars, where the hagiographic treatment of allied militaries in national histories can render such material invisible and uncomfortable. Um, as the work of Mary um, Louise Roberts, Marin Roger and others have shown, understanding sex and sexual violence can tell us much about the power relations in the military, um, the relationship between the military and civilians, and the way that this, these relationships were structured by assumptions about race, gender and socioeconomic concerns. These studies also emphasise that wartime rape cannot be understood outside of these um, 
other kinds of sexual encounters, in particular soldiers' contact with sex workers and the opinions and assumptions that they held about these women. Now, I found similar themes borne out in some work that I did several years ago and work that I have to say has troubled me ever since because I found my analysis in some ways to be quite unsatisfactory, felt that it was unfinished. In that work, which eventually became a chapter in an edited collection about the Pacific War, I tried to reconstruct a gang rape um, committed by Australian soldiers of the 2nd 13th Battalion in Miri in Sarawak, in British Borneo, in early August 1945. The Australians had arrived um, in the area around Miri a month previously with orders to flush out the remnants of scattered Japanese units to secure the burning oil field and begin to rebuild infrastructure in the formerly occupied territory. On the night in question, four Australian soldiers, two of them carrying weapons, had entered a house in the Chinese quarter where a couple lived with their six children and the husband's elderly parents. By the end of the following day, the four soldiers were in custody, awaiting courts martial for what the unit diary described as the outrage in Miri, the repeated, very serious rapes of the two adult women present in the house that night. By the end of September, Three of the soldiers had been court-martialed and sentenced to lengthy periods of imprisonment. And yet less than three years later, um, all three men had been released from a civilian prison in Brisbane on the direction of the Minister for the Army, a decision that appeared, as far as I can tell, to have been part of a broader government policy to release servicemen convicted of rape against native women before their full sentence had been served. Now, from my reading of the courts martial transcripts and other archival material, the unit diary in particular, I argue that the battalion leadership viewed the rapes in Miri both as crimes of violence, but also as breaches of medical discipline, and that the battalion's concern over the possibility of Australian soldiers contracting venereal diseases from women working as undercover or unofficial prostitutes in Miri had likely conveyed to the men um, the suggestion that the local women were both desirable and available, albeit dangerous. Now that's not to exculpate the perpetrators in any way, but to suggest that the battalion's warnings about VD and the prevalence, prevalence of unofficial prostitution in the town might have created a situation in which the perpetrators could claim, as they did at trial, that the younger victim was a prostitute and had therefore consented to sexual intercourse, a claim that the court rejected. After the piece was published, I also felt that there was much more to say about the way Australian authorities uh, dealt with sexual violence in the Second World War. And in particular, this indication that in correspondence from the Minister for the Army, that the race of the victim might have dictated leniency for the perpetrators. That race might operate in that way, have those consequences, was not particularly surprising, those of us acquainted with the um, the way that race and sexual violence intersect historically and in contemporary times. Um, but a sense, I wanted a sense of the number of cases involved, all the while bearing in mind that, of course, not all cases of sexual violence or most cases of sexual violence um, would have been reported. Um, but a sense of the figures that, that the bureaucracy was grappling with when it made this decision about comparative leniency for um, the perpetrators of these kinds of rapes would have been extremely helpful in understanding the prevalence of sexual violence committed by Australian soldiers in the Pacific as well as other theatres of war. Unfortunately though I felt like this avenue of research was stymied a little bit by simple logistics. It would have required extensive work in the courts martial files in the National Archives of which there are about 90,000, with very few of those files identified by offence, makes it very difficult to sort of sift that those 90,000 cases or courts martial transcripts, courts martial, courts martial files in a helpful way. Now, this new collaborative project that I'm about to undertake with colleagues does present an opportunity to address this in part because there are now several of us available um, and keen to get to work on these courts martial records, but also because of a large digitisation project based at Griffith University that's slowly making its way through the courts martial index. So we have our fingers crossed and we wait with bated breath for what um, those digitised files 
and the possibilities of search in them, what that might show. Now, apart from wishing I knew, not, I knew more about the numerical prevalence, as far as I could establish it, of um, sexual violence committed by Australians in the Pacific, I was also unhappy with the way the invisibility, I was unhappy with the invisibility of the victims um, and the victim's stories, their experiences in my telling of this story. Legal requirements had excised the names of the two victims and the witnesses who were family members, as well, incidentally, of the one soldier who was given a markedly lighter sentence, which suggested to me that he was either still alive when I requested, I requested the transcripts or that he'd been found ultimately not guilty or an accessory, I guess, to the commission of the crime. Um, so these women were anonymous and their testimony was also mediated by the routines of the courtroom. And, of course, I was accessing um, the transcripts of their evidence through barriers of language. I was reading a translation. Even so, I felt that in my focus on the way that the battalion authorities and then civilian officials had managed the conviction and imprisonment of the perpetrators um, had aligned the experience of these women. Indeed, it had almost instrumentalised them. Perhaps there's no good way of avoiding this when one's trying to deal with and write about bureaucratic processes and, and using fragmentary sources to do so. Perhaps even the best thing to do um, in such a circumstance is to acknowledge it, to acknowledge it up front. But I am hoping with um, extended work on these courts martial transcripts and thinking about sexual violence in the Australian military to think about more deeply about how to include the voices and the stories of victims in a way that adds to analytic clarity, but without that hint of instrumentalization. And part of that thinking, of course, involves talking to my collaborators, but it also means listening to and learning from all of you in forums like this. Now, that question of hearing victims dovetails directly into the context in which I speak, the contemporary context, and I, I feel I have to address that. And I'm sure my Australian colleagues who speak in this forum will feel they have to address it as well. I'm recording this talk after several very unsettling weeks in Australian federal politics, in Australian or discussion, I guess, in the public sphere in Australia, in which sexual violence against women has taken centre stage. First, there was the mishandling of an allegation of rape against a ministerial staffer, an allegation that caused several other women to come forward with stories of similar violence perpetrated by the same man in similar workplaces. Then the chief of the defence force um, had to defend himself against accusations that he'd engaged in victim blaming by warning first year cadets in the course of a welcoming speech at the Australian Defence Force Academy, warning them they should avoid being prey for sexual predators um, by trying not to be out alone, um, drinking alcohol after midnight and by being attractive. Now, Defence stressed that the General had intended um, all those comments to apply to cadets of all genders. He was not singling out the women in the group um, needing to modify their behaviour. Um, but that was certainly the implication that, that people drew. It was reminiscent of victim blaming and it certainly didn't play well given the media storm about the revelations the previous week about the ministerial staffer. Then finally, on top of this, reports began to surface that a very high ranking member of the federal government, uh, the federal cabinet, the attorney general, no less, um, was the subject of a very serious rape allegation which a complainant alleged took place when they were both teenagers in the late 1980s and which the complainant's friends now contended had contributed to her ill health and eventual suicide in 2020. The death of the complainant now means that the investigation against the Attorney General can't proceed, the police case is closed and the, he has emphatically denied any wrongdoing um, in a press conference. This makes the resolution of this case extremely complex and the government is insisting that the rule of law requires that the case be closed while the friends of the woman and her family are now pushing for an independent inquiry. And there's been unedifying, if not predictable, commentary and speculation in the press and on social media about the woman's mental state and the veracity of her memories. Not so much about the recollections of the Attorney General, I have to say. Now, I can only speak anecdotally, but I suspect that for many women, 
as well, of course, um, for survivors of sexual violence, of both genders, watching this unfold has been enraging, but also almost instructive because it demonstrates the way that laudable values, like the presumption of innocence in criminal proceedings, values that should protect the vulnerable and do protect the vulnerable in certain contexts, might also shield the powerful in others. I don't know how we reconcile that ambiguity. I don't know if we can, but these issues in the present day must make us continue to ask questions about sexual violence in the past, um, if only to learn more about its prevalence and the circumstances that make perpetration possible. Thank you.